I call to order the meeting of the Budget and Business Services Committee for Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. Um, and I want to mention that um, Section A is general information regarding the meetings of the board. And Deborah, please um, recognize and note the commissioners who are present. And we do have a quorum um, with um, Commissioner Alexander and, and Commissioner Sanchez uh, will be absent this evening. I'd like to welcome Superintendent Matthews, um, Chief Wallace, uh, Deputy Superintendent Lee, uh, Director Corden, district staff, and, and members of the public. Uh, today we have one informational item, one very important big um, informational item, which is our uh, zero-based uh, budgeting uh, as budget uh, stabilization plan. So at this time, um, I'd like to call on uh, CFO Megan Wallace. Thank you, Commissioner Lamb. Good evening, everybody. Um, so if we can go ahead and share the presentation. Oh, interpretation will be provided tonight also. Um, they have interpreta interpreters. Do I need to read the, um, the numbers? Hi there. This is the interpreter. So we can do it in English, in Spanish, in Cantonese. Wonderful. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. SFUSD is offering interpretation services in Spanish and Cantonese. If you need interpretation, please dial the following phone number. After dialing, please introduce the PIN number. This message will be repeated in Spanish and Cantonese. Buenas tardes, el Distrito Escolar Unificado de San Francisco ofrece servicios de interpretación en el idioma español. Si necesita interpretación por medio de Google Meet, por favor marque el siguiente número telefónico, seguido de la clave de acceso. Número telefónico, uno, 319-382-9676. Por favor, introduzca la clave 665-996-976, seguido de la tecla numeral. Gracias. Cantonese interpreter, please. Thank you. Takaho. Sampan si, Luna Pao Koi. Hey, come on, go with you, though. I would take on Gondon Waka Chunyak for more. So you go, let's show you Gondon Waka Chunyak for more. Ching Dati Mato. Yat. 四八四八五四三三二八，然后输入密码七二一六零九八九五井。该晒，Thank you. Yeah, brother, does that con um, wrap up our announcements? Yes, it does. Commissioner, Great. you can start the meeting. Thank you. Go ahead. Um... Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Deborah, may I ask you if you could double check the permissions for Elliot Duchon, our fiscal yeah, expert? Yeah, I just sent, it, I sent him the link, but I'm having Jill also do it right now. Okay, wonderful. I did get the email. So I did send it to him, but I'm waiting for him to log in and I don't see him. Okay. So I asked her to do it again. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we can go ahead and proceed um, since the uh, beginning is really around orientation of why we're here and um, we've been having a lot of great conversations with Mr. Deshawn about this subject so I think um, he won't um, he'll be familiar with it as it is. Um, so um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, we are just dis discussing um, the proposed budget balancing plan for SFUSD um, and on the next slide please. I just want to highlight two major uh, components of the discussion this evening. Uh, the first part is Proposition G, um, or the Living Wage for Educators Act. I'm going to provide an update on the, um, on the lawsuit um, and the anticipated revenues um, that we'll receive as a district, as well as the proposed use of those funds. Um, and then uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Gordon, our Executive Director of Budget Services, uh, will um, also share some information about different scenarios of um, uh, how school sites uh, might adapt uh, to changes in their budget. And this is part of the review of the proposed budget balancing plan, just discussing the trade-offs between um, the proposal and, and have an opportunity uh, for the board and the public um, to share um, thoughts and ask questions um, about the, the plan as currently proposed. On the next slide, 
you can see that this is part of a series of various meetings. Just always want to orient us around um, the different phases of review of the balancing plan. In the first step, we rolled out um, the plan itself um, as an introduction. Um, we're now in the second step of the process of discussing the plan and providing feedback, thinking about ways to iterate um, on the proposal. Just want to highlight that we did have a budget town hall last night. Um, thank you, Commissioner Lamb, for being a panelist and to everybody else who joined and listened in and asked questions um, at that event. Um, and now this evening, um, we're stepping into the last of the first of two meetings where we'll um, uh, with the Board of Education specifically to look at the proposed uses of Proposition G and discuss um, possible um, you know, trade-offs within the plan. And of course, just keeping ourselves oriented around December 14th as the date where uh, staff will be seeking Board of Education approval of the first interim report, um, which will include uh, the balancing plan. On the next slide, I just want to remind everyone that this is uh, you know, a, a stage that's fairly early on. Uh, in a process that's heading us towards um, uh, budget adoption, that the balancing plan is for fiscal year 22-23. So while we're in fiscal year 21-22, we're planning for the next fiscal year's budget. Um, and that uh, here we are fairly early on in the stages identifying this balancing plan that ultimately in the early months of, fiscal, of calendar year 2022, uh, staff will be working to implement that balancing plan so that ultimately uh, we can bring a final budget proposal before the Board of Education um, in June in time to submit um, an adopted budget to CDE uh, no later than July 1st. On the next slide, um, just since we're actually technically in a Budget and Business Services Committee meeting where we have definitely taken over the agenda to focus primarily on the budget balancing plan for some period of time. I uh, just want to highlight that <clears throat> we will have uh, future BBS meetings covering some other areas of business that uh, we've tabled for the time being. So I want to highlight that tonight we're looking at the balancing plan. Um, next week we're actually going to use the Committee of the Whole to cover informational items um, on the first interim report, as well as a, an expenditure plan for the educator um, block uh, uh, effectiveness block grant. Um, and then in January, we'll actually have a series of discussions around um, PEEF um, and uh, the equity and arts resolution. So on the next slide, just want to go ahead and transition to this first point of um, discussion around Proposition G. Um, on the next slide, um, I just want to give a little bit of background around Proposition G <clears throat> for anyone who's not familiar with it. Um, as a reminder, in 2018, 61% of San Francisco voters um, authorized Proposition G or the Living Wage for Educators Act, uh, which is a, an annual parcel tax um, that property owners pay. Um, and the anticipated revenue um, at that point in time in 2018 was $50 million to SFUSD um, that would be used to increase uh, salaries and benefits for teachers and other school district employees, um, looking at additional funding for high needs schools and community schools. So um, all of those um, expenditures are, were encompassed in the intended use of LWEA. Um, however, a lawsuit was filed um, arguing that we should have had a two-thirds supermajority vote um, to, in order to pass that ballot measure. And over the last three years, um, that lawsuit has been making its way through the California court system. And as a result, one, um, $150 million was withheld over that period of time, or $50 million annually. Um, and then also, rather than halt the salary increases that had been anticipated um, uh, under LWEA, um, the district moved to um, continue the expenditure plan uh, related to LWEA, but we reduced those costs from $50 million a year to $40 million a year. 
And in order to do that, um, the city actually loaned SFUSD $26.6 million, and we withdrew $93.4 million from the district's rainy day reserve. Um, and then because the total revenue was actually $50 million a year over the course of that three years, $30 million of the parcel tax has actually gone unspent um, and has been uh, held by the city in an escrow account. Um, the wonderful news um, along the way of this story is that in November 2020, Proposition J uh, was a, approved by uh, San Francisco voters by se over 74%, which well exceeds um, that supermajority vote. Um, and Proposition J now replaces Proposition G. Um, and this is important because just want to make sure everybody is oriented around the fact that Proposition J is the ongoing funding source for this um, for for the expenditures associated with this parcel tax. Proposition G is now in effect over, except for the $150 million that was held over this three-year uh, window of time. Next slide, please. So the other round of wonderful news that we only just recently learned about is that the California Supreme Court declined to hear the case um, on Proposition G, which in effect uh, confirmed the California appellate, appellate Court's ruling that the parcel tax should be upheld. Um, so that authorized the release of these funds. And again, this is a one-time source. Three years of Proposition G parcel tax has been accumulated and now it's being released um, to um, SFUSD, um, recognizing that 123.4 million of those funds should go to SFUSD, whereas 26.6 million is intended to repay the city for its loan to the district. Um, however, there is um, a plan by Mayor London Breed and uh, Supervisor Ronan to introduce legislation that would forgive the loan to the district. Um, but that does come with a very important condition that we as a district act um, to develop a budget stabilization plan. Um, so now in effect, we actually have two parties um, that are looking at the actions of our school district, um, the city and county that in order to forgive this loan, um, as well as the California Department of Education um, is looking to the district, all with the eye of seeing that we're ready to stabilize our budget. Um, and so I think we're definitely working along that path. Um, and um, so the proposal before you this evening talks about an assumption that we will receive the full $150 million. But even though $150 million has a breakdown. So um, just to walk you through it a little bit, uh, when the Board of Education authorized the fir first withdrawal of funds from the Rainy Day Reserve, um, that resolution called for $40 million to go back to the Rainy Day Reserve. So um, staff is continuing to assume that that is a requirement, that of that $150 million, we would restore $40 million uh, into our reserves. However, $53.4 million of that really in effect repays um, the expenditures that we made um, that were LWEA eligible, um, but using the rainy day reserve. Um, and so because it's really a repayment to the district, um, those funds are more flexible and may be used for general purposes um, within our budget. Um, but then on top of that, there's that $30 million that was unspent over that period of time. And those funds, um, and any potential interest um, earnings that had accumulated over that period of time all must be used for LWEL, uh, LWEA eligible expenses. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, CDE and the city are watching the district closely at this point in time. Um, and so we really must step forward and show that we're committed to addressing our structural budget deficit. But I do want to highlight that that uh, maintenance of our budget is really part of 
at least a three point uh, balancing act that we play as a district as um, a, a public organization um, that must balance its budget. We also have um, a real need to maintain an operating reserve and address our unfunded long term liabilities and our commitments to staff. These are three factors that really um, that the well being and and our ability uh, to manage these factors uh, will um, indicate the strength of our financial outlook and our overall stability. Um, so you'll see in the proposal before you that all three of these um, components are taken into account uh, with the use of these this $150 million. Um, I also just want to mention that um, the credit our district's credit ratings um, have been downgraded in recent years. Um, and um, all of the major agencies, Moody's, Fitch, S&P, look closely at these factors of are we maintaining a balanced budget? Do we have a meaningful operating reserve? And are we managing our unfunded liabilities? Um, and I would anticipate that if we don't take a balanced approach with our use of these funds, we will see further declines um, in our credit ratings. And why does that matter? Um, keep in mind that when we move forward with uh, sales of our general obligation bonds, uh, which are authorized uh, by San Francisco voters uh, to use uh, uh, our, the uh, San Francisco property taxes um, to maintain our facilities. Um, it's important for us to make those funds go as far as they possibly can. And if we have higher credit ratings, the cost of those funds is lower. And when we have poor credit ratings, the cost of those funds um, is higher. And therefore, the, the value doesn't go as far in maintaining our facilities. So it truly is important for us to maintain um, high credit. Um, and so again, just overall, keeping in mind CDE, the city, as well as credit rating agencies, um, these are all things that should be taken into account. Um, and, and I am recommending we take a balanced approach with our use of these one-time funds. Next slide, please. So in order to consider ways of how to use these funds um, and taking into account that balanced approach versus what would it look like if we weren't so balanced, um, staff examined a, a variety of scenarios um, just to see how, how things look. Um, and I wanna highlight first option A, um, which is the scenario that commits a short term, um, commits more funds to short term budget balancing. So in this table, if you look at option A, you can see that there's $40 million for the rainy day reserve, um, $20 million to pre-fund OPEB, which is represents um, our retiree health benefits, um, and then $90 million for staffing or budget stabilization. Um, so option A really commits heavily to that you know, component of that short-term need of balancing our budget. But the real problem with that is you can see that our OPEB liabilities remain very high. We're currently looking at a $1 billion OPEB liability. Um, this $20 million um, investment scenario does bring that down, but you can see that over the next 10 year window, um, that liability continues to grow. And I would anticipate it could grow to as much as 1.5 billion. Um, and when credit rating agencies, for example, look at this plan, they'll see that we're doing two things wrong. Um, the one thing we're doing right is investing in our rainy day. The things that we're not doing correctly is we're not stabilizing our, our unfunded long-term liabilities with OPEB, and we're using a one-time source to stabilize our budget, um, which means that we're not addressing our need um, to uh, right size um, how um, we're spending compared to the revenue that we're generating. Um, and I know that CDE as well as the city would look at this scenario um, and question it. And then we would run the risk of one, possibly um, having our balancing plan not be approved and two, having the city decide that they should not forgive our loan. Um, in contrast, option D, again, looks at the rainy day reserve as 40 million, but invests more in OPEB prefunding um, and less in budget stabilization. 
Um, so I think while um, it does significantly improve that long-term liability outlook, um, you can see that there's less going into budget stabilization and that calls into question, is it possible for us to actually use more at this point in time uh, to address our immediate needs? So that's where we get to options B or C. Um, in options B or C, um, OPEB prefunding is locked in at $60 million. Um, this is a minimum amount necessary uh, to be able to uh, change our trajectory on our OPEB liabilities. Our actuary has said that if we invest that amount, um, they, will, um, they will recalculate our, um, our liabilities um, at a much lower rate because in effect, by putting those funds away, they will generate their own interest earnings that help um, pay down and cover those liabilities of OPEB over time. Um, for budget and, and staffing stabilization, that's, that's actually where things are uh, different uh, between options B and C. Option B uh, looks at the balanced needs of balancing our budget with the call um, of district employees for additional compensation. Um, I think that we are seeing the impacts um, of the pandemic on our staff either be it part of um, employees leaving our district uh, due to financial hardship or other stress uh, related to working um, under the pandemic related conditions um, or our inability to hire uh, just simply because um, people aren't as incentivized uh, to come join the, work, the district workforce in San Francisco. Um, that need, um, we would propose considering um, $25 million to put forward to negotiate um, with our labor partners um, and consider a plan for spreading that one-time source of funds for one-time uses. Um, and that may mean that, that these funds are spent over time, but we would need to negotiate the terms of, of the use of those funds. Um, and that would leave $25 million for budget stabilization. Um, I would propose using $10 million in the first year and $15 million in the second year, um, because as everyone's aware, the deficit deepens in the second year. Uh, so uh, due to declines, anticipated declines in enrollment, um, so which uh, flattens our revenue growth, um, as well as increased costs over time. So that's option B. Option C in contrast, um, uses that $50 million uh, solely for budget stabilization, um, where we could look to restore our investments um, that had been proposed for reduction. Um, you know, uh, so in either scenario, we would want to look to um, areas where we would want to prioritize restoring funding, um, such as weighted student formula uh, to increase funding for our, our school sites. So I hope this helps give um, sort of a, a picture of um, the different um, trade-offs between the various scenarios. Um, I would recommend that um, while options B and C um, do provide um, the best balance between these three areas of setting aside funds for our reserves, Prefunding OPEB to address our unfunded liabilities and then setting aside $50 million for stabilization purposes. Um, there is a very clear argument for option B uh, to be able to um, address the needs of our employees um, who have been calling uh, for, for additional supports um, and, and, uh, and payment um, as a result of the hardships of working through the pandemic. Next slide, please. So um, here I just wanna briefly review the balancing plan. Um, you know, overall, just as a reminder, the proposal um, is to reduce expenditures by $90 million. So you can see the total expenditures line in light green uh, shows a reduction of 90 million. Um, and then an increase in funding sources of 35 million dollars and that's a combination of uh, shifting costs onto new grants so new funding sources 
um, and also utilizing fund balance um, that we've worked to set aside uh, to help us stabilize our budget. On the next slide, I just want to demonstrate what it would look like if we were to uh, look at option B, where uh, we restore $10 million uh, to, um, to our expenditures. Um, and that, um, I, in, it, in that scenario, I would recommend restoring uh, to our weighted student formula. Um, so you can see that rather than reducing site-based budgets by 50 million, uh, we would restore 10 million and only end, end up uh, reducing uh, the budgets by 40 million. Um, and we're able to do that because under the sources, you can see we have increased um, our sources overall by $10 million uh, using the Proposition G funding. And then on the next slide, you can see what the overall, on the next slide, you can see what the overall plan looks like uh, in more detail with those changes. Megan, hold on just to pause. If I can please have panelists, uh, please mute. So there's not the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. And then on the next slide, I'll go ahead and close out my section and then hand it over to Anne-Marie. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that our projections are going to continue to um, evolve beyond this point in time. I think that Proposition G um, is a unique and valuable opportunity for the district to evaluate our priorities. And when I say unique, let's just say that not every school district has $150 million land on their laps when they're trying to build a budget balancing plan. Um, but when we're evaluating our priorities, uh, we just have to keep in mind it's not just what are our priorities within the budget that we're trying to balance, but also within um, those other line items uh, related to our, uh, restoring our reserves and addressing our liabilities. Those represent our larger financial uh, structural package as a district. Um, and so Proposition G does provide a unique opportunity for us to evaluate these priorities. Um, and then also, um, you know, the financial projections are going to continue to change, particularly with the release of the governor's uh, January budget. Uh, we are uh, seeing that state revenues are exceeding the enacted budget in the current year. So we're anticipating that new revenues will be identified and can, um, and can very likely improve um, our outlook. Um, but on top of that, um, we as a district are advocating for changes in the local control funding formula, um, which our projections for revenue have declined because our enrollment has declined. Um, however, we are um, making the argument um, that if enrollment has declined across the state, um, that there may simply need to be a change in the way that the state allocates funds to school districts. Um, and, and then additionally, we're advocating for additional special education funding and other priorities. Um, so these are all important elements to keep in mind that um, as we turn into the new calendar year, um, we will be coming back and having a lot more conversations. But at this point in time, we have to work with what we know. Um, and uh, it's for that purpose that we do need to move forward um, and reach agreement on a budget balancing plan. So with that, on the next slide, um, I'd like to please hand it over to Anne-Marie. Thank you, Megan, and uh, good evening, everybody. So we just have a couple more slides uh, to share this evening, and this is um, kind of a starting point to build from some of our previous conversations uh, where there have been a number of requests to start understanding what the impacts of the current budget balancing plan would have on school sites. So on the next slide, we do have um, a number of caveats to these scenarios um, for a number of reasons. We really, I really want to emphasize that while we did use, you know, real school budgets and real staffing data to put together these scenarios, they are illustrations. They are not final decisions. They are not right. They're not set in stone. It's really meant 
to be an example of how the combination of a reduction in weighted student formula, a potential reduction to MTSS, the multi-tiered system of supports, or other allocations might come together in a school's budget. So the information is approximate. Um, and really what we have done is modeled these potential changes uh, by looking at draft numbers, right? Draft projected enrollment numbers, draft weighted student formula preliminary allocations. Um, but just, I want, I want to really put that, put that asterisk on these scenarios simply because we do have time between the board's vote on the budget balancing plan and finalizing allocations uh, to share in the first few weeks of February. And so they, right, they, are, they are reflective of the proposed plan, but they have also been generalized. And so I just, I just really want to make sure that, that nobody feels as if we, you know, we're selecting certain schools or anything like that. It's all been generalized to give a sense of how changes might be made. Um, and in particular, um, I will say that we've looked at a couple of examples where there are um, more significant or more noticeable drops in enrollment, um, just to help illustrate what, in some cases, a more significant reduction uh, could potentially look like for a school. So keeping all that in mind, uh, we can go to the next slide, which is an example of a small elementary school. And I do encourage everyone to take some time and look at the different slides. I'll briefly walk through them, but I also, um, I think it's, it's helpful to kind of go through the pieces, um, you know, at a pace that works for you and kind of working through all of the information. But looking at this slide up at the top, we have uh, five years of enrollment trends that we used for weighted student formula. So these are, um, and it includes, uh, right, our, our initial projection for 22-23. The table below that is looking at, again, at an elementary level, a sample of how classrooms might be organized. And so here you can see, based on the projected enrollment by grade and the number of classrooms, then right what the class sizes would be and what that would mean in terms of a change from the current state. In this case, it could mean a reduction of classrooms where there have traditionally, or for the past few years, been very small kindergarten and first grade classrooms. Then on the right, we bring in not just weighted student formula and classrooms, but a look at the other support staff at a school site. And this is an example where what we've done is really put all the pieces together and just go through an exercise to model how a school might balance their budget, considering all of their allocations in one, as right, kind of putting it all together. It doesn't mean that this is a decision that would be made. It was just right going through, looking at what are the pieces of our weighted student formula baseline, how much money is there to maintain current staffing, and where, right, where might a school need to look at how they focus their supports um, and how they may need to scale back staffing. And so this is a case where the proposed weighted student formula baseline does include the funding for a full-time administrative partner. But as a small school, it appears that this site has also used funds to make sure that they have a full-time nurse um, and paraprofessionals to support students in the classrooms and some other staff. And so this was a case where, although an administrative partner's in the baseline, perhaps the other kind of wraparound comprehensive coaching and social emotional supports may be the highest value to this site. Again, just an example, but looking at how, how a budget might be balanced. And I think also one piece to note here is if you go through those changes, a reduction of two FTE teachers, um, a an administrative partner and a second literacy coach. This is this is looking at how a school might balance with a reduction of three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. It's a significant reduction, 
And so I think I, I do want to name that at this level of a staffing reduction is is a large dollar amount to balance to. But I also think what you see here is while that reduction is true, there's also the school is able to maintain um, a reasonable set of supports for its for its students. Next slide, please. The structure of this slide and, and the following are the same. It's three different scenarios. Um, this is one that is a larger elementary school. So you can see that um, the enrollment is more in the 400 to 500 student range. Um, and there's a similar, a similar situation here because of a large drop in enrollment over the past five years where classrooms um, could be reduced with class sizes being maintained at reasonable levels. Um, this is a site that does not have the same level of multi-tiered system of support staffing. Um, and so the, you can see that there are those supplemental supports in place, but not to the same degree. Uh, however, again, this is one illustration of how reductions could be made and the supports that would still be in place at this school site. Next slide. Our final example here is a larger middle school. And really, the idea here was to start to, kind of, to build a format and build a structure to share this information. Uh, when it comes time to really finalize school allocations, we will still go through our school planning and budget development processes in February and March. And so what that means is that Again, this illustrates considerations that will need to be made. And I think we will be thinking more about how to, how to provide guidance and recommendations in particular, I think around the weighted student formula baseline and how to use that as a starting point for budget considerations and staffing considerations. But what you can see here is, um, is that there isn't only one way, I think, to, right, to balance these budgets across the different support staff. We tried to take you know, a couple of different approaches for how that might happen, but it isn't, right? It is not a one size fits all and the cases, and this will not be the exact same case for every site. So I think I'm more than happy to answer questions. And um, I think you know, we'll wanna continue to understand where we should provide more specificity or develop more scenarios we are looking really closely at starting to do this school by school deep dive to make sure that when it comes time for allocations, we understand what kinds of decisions schools may need to make as they, as they look to balance their budget and as budgets are aligned to enrollment. So I think with that, um, I'll go ahead and hand it back to Megan for the final slide. Thanks, Anne Marie. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, um, sorry to keep saying this over again, but I think it's good to be grounded in our process. That you know, just as a reminder, we did review the budget balancing plan in over the course of November, um, and this is the first of two opportunities to discuss and iterate on this proposal. Although the next meeting is just next week, so. Um, it's we're we're moving fast here, everybody. Um, but I think this evening, um, you know, when it comes to the discussion, just some ideas of you know things that I'd love to hear from uh, from the board and from the public on is around the balance um, that's struck in the proposals um, around staffing and budget stabilization. Um, you know, thinking about if we were to restore funds um, I, I, for our in terms of our budget balancing plan, um, does it make sense to restore $10 million to the weighted student formula? Is that the right approach? Um, and then just keeping in mind that uh, the appendix includes all of the other slides from prior presentations. So if anyone wants to dive in and take a look or um, a closer look at any um, aspect of the plan, um, I would uh, welcome and encourage us to do that. So um, thank you. Happy to answer questions.
Thank you. Thank you so much to Megan and Anne-Marie um, for your work. Uh, before I open up to public comment, I wanted to ask commissioners um, and student delegate uh, for any clarifying questions. And I believe Commissioner Bogus had your hand up earlier. Go ahead. Yes, I had two qu clarifying questions. Um, on the proposed kind of budgets that show the, the sites that were kind of scenarios, um, the, the like in the the I guess it was a large middle school, the reduction to a literacy coach. And now would that be a decision that was actually made at a school site or is that a decision that was made at central office? To my knowledge, it'd be a school site making that decision for themselves. Is that correct? In this case, uh, in this case, yes, I think there is a little it will depend a little bit on the MTSS allocations. There would be cases where a school right, has a reduction in their MTSS allocation, and that could mean reducing a lit coach. But in this particular scenario, this is looking, um, I believe that this is, this is based off of a tier one larger middle school, which means that they do not have that lit coach allocation through MTSS, so site funds. Okay, you know, I, I appreciate that. That it does concern me whenever we ask school staff to get rid of like vital staff that serve certain populations and look forward to having more questions about that. My next question was about slide 10, where we showed the different options, A, B, C, and D. And I was just wondering if there was any more clarity that was available on the $25 million split and option B. Um, and kind of what it what, what it would look like to spend that money and kind of like the the expectation of kind of how far that money would reach and helping to address labor issues um, and other kind of um, things that we would, would be stabilizing with. I, I just kind of want to get a clear picture of kind of how that money could be used if we're going to redirect it. Deputy Superintendent Lee, I see your hand up. Did you want to respond? Thanks, uh, Commissioner Lamb. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, sort of on a process note, mention that uh, although we're sharing some information at a high level tonight about uh, possible choices in terms of setting a certain uh, range of funds aside, uh, we, we would want to be cognizant of the, uh, of the, the, the boundaries of uh, what kinds of discussions can take place uh, away from the bargaining table or tables as the case may be. So um, in that light would just suggest that uh, to the extent uh, staff uh, should uh, present our thinking and, and seek the board's direction um, about potential proposals uh, at, in a bargaining context, we would uh, seek to do that in a, in a closed session. Um, and have uh, the proper discussions with our labor partners um, in a bargaining context. And I see Dr. Matthews has uh, come on screen. If, uh, if, if I messed anything up there. Super no, you didn't. I was just gonna say at a very high level, we, you know, this is a, about uh, doing everything we can to stabilize our, uh, our uh, labor, labor partners. And so definitely those kinds of discussions of what it would be used for would definitely be at the bargaining table, but we would, as we always do, seek a uh, board's direction in closed session. Mr. Bogus, did you have any follow-up for a clarifying question? I think just, I, I guess, did does staff feel that the 25 million that is attributed there is like significant? Is that too much? like to say even in, in this context, I guess I'm just yes. trying to get an understanding. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Alexander. Um, thank you, um, Commissioner Lamb. So maybe just in clarifying questions, following up on that last um, line of conversation, I had thought that all of Prop G was supposed to be negotiated with um, UESF. Is that not the case? I guess you know. What I mean, that this whole conversation would take place at the at the bargaining table. I can I can try to address that, uh, Commissioner Lamb, and Commissioner Alexander. The the MOUs that we have with our respective labor partners um, do apply differently to Prop G versus Prop J, 
and our MOU with um, UESF in particular for uh, Prop G and for Prop J outline that 75% uh, of the of the revenues in any given fiscal year would be subject to an MOU uh, with between the district and UESF. Um, that said, in the Prop J MOU, uh, which was ratified this past August, that part of the, the uh, provisions in that MOU were that Prop J, the Prop J MOU basically takes the place of the Prop G MOU. Um, so, so we are now square in terms of, um, in terms of uh, all of the uh, formal boundaries of negotiations related to, to Prop G as well as Prop J. Um, so this would be a, an additional layer of, of negotiations on top of that context. Okay, so it's not, so you're saying it's not subject or I guess I'm... By, by mutual agreement, nothing prevents uh, both parties from, from entering into additional uh, negotiations, but, but uh, we are not currently bound by any addition, by any outstanding uh, provisions of, of previously negotiated MOUs. Okay, that's helpful. Um, thanks, um, Deputy Superintendent. My, my second question was around the, the um, proposed payment to the rainy day fund and how that relates to our operating reserve. Is the rainy day fund considered part of that operating reserve or, or is that separate? Um, it has historically been uh, separate. Um, and when we're reporting to the California Department of Education, because the city's funds aren't held by the district, um, they haven't historically been uh, calculated. Um, however, I, I think one other point of discussion for the board to consider is um, if we would want to hold those funds in the district's reserve, um, really uh, with the same constraints, I would recommend as um, as when they're with the cities in the city's account. Um, because one, we want a lot of controls. We want the board to have to act that there's a real demonstrated need to draw down those funds. Um, but really just from an administrative standpoint, um, it's very helpful to have the cash in our accounts um, to help cover um, the various dips that we have throughout the year. Um, just last year, we had to do a short-term borrowing to cover for such a dip if we'd had those funds in our accounts. Um, we might not have otherwise have had to do that. Um, and furthermore, um, it makes it clear uh, to sh in our reporting that those funds um, are part of our calculated reserve in the eyes of CDE. Um, our, the rating agencies are really good about digging up those numbers and building them into their calculation of how much we have in hand to cover um, ourselves in the, in the event of a rainy day, um, but having them in our own account would uh, make it all the more transparent. Thanks, Chief Wallace. And is that, would, if we, how would, I'm just trying to get a sense of where we would get to between that 4% and 10% you mentioned. If we, you know, if we put 40 million Let's let's assume for these purposes that it was in our reserve. What would what would that get us to on an ongoing basis? Do you know what I mean? Um, so I've calculated that it would get us at approximately six percent. Okay. Okay. Um, so we could add more theoretically if we wanted to get closer to ten. Yes, and I and ten is sort of the magic number. I don't know if you're pulling that off of um, one of the slides. From your slide, yeah. No, I was yeah. using what you were what you yep. said, yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, good, you got 10. Uh, yes, listening. Um, you know, from, from the credit rating agency standpoint, that's the ideal number. I would say that um, many district, districts probably um, have a difficult time achieving that, um, although clearly we were well in that range um, before we drew down from the rainy day reserve. So uh, we just hadn't given ourselves credit for it <laughs> um, in terms of our documentation. Cool. I have one last clarifying question, and if this is outside the scope of this meeting, feel free to defer this. Um, but it's more about the OPEB um, contribution, and just curious if, if we could get some more information on how those projections are calculated. So, I, I, like I said, I think I said it at a previous meeting. I, I really support the idea of doing it. I guess I just want to make sure that we're that we're being very transparent about, for example, what's the current demand on the trust. 
Um, what's the projected growth of that demand? How did we get to that number? You know, those different calculations. Um, because I think it is a big investment and I think we just wanna make sure that we're providing everyone that information. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Maybe um, Megan or uh, Commissioner Alexander, I, I have lots of questions and follow up to that as well. If we can just hold that for discussion, perhaps um, after public comment, how's that? Um, yeah, that's fine with me. I, and like I said, maybe not even this. I don't know if that's for this meeting even, but I just want. No, I think it's it. definitely. I would like for us to actually um, okay. have a little bit of discussion there, since it is part of the balancing plan, and and would right. want to make sure that um, the staff is clear about our um, as we you know come come into the final weeks of December fourteenth and that um, balancing. So with that, um, thank you, colleagues. I think that is all for clarifying questions. Um, and so I would like to open it up for public comment, please, Deborah. Yes, can we have that translated in Spanish and Chinese too, please? If you want to raise your hand to speak to Thank this you. item, please do it. Por favor, levante su mano si desea añadir un comentario público. Gracias. Có lẽ chúng tôi lý có cái hòa phát biểu ý kiến cái hòa, xin cả hai Zoom có chuyện cầm cái sau cái chạy, cảm ơn cháu hỏi gì để phát biểu ý kiến cái hòa phát biểu um, how many minutes, Commissioner? Um, we have four. Let's do two minutes, up to two minutes, please. Okay. Um, Alan? Alan? Alan Lee? Alan? Maybe we can come back to them. Um, Rory? Hi. So I wanted to, um, I heard a lot about balancing the budget, but there's also concerns that um, Mike Klein mentioned at the LCAP meeting about reporting and compliance around reporting LCAP processes and um, making sure that the budget is transparent and that we have just one budget and not multiple and nobody quite understands where the money is going. So I'd like, just you know just a request that going forward that you talk about some of those how you're going to resolve some of those um state of california legal and compliance issues around um, public having full access and clear information about what's going on with the budget and having just one budget going forward thank you okay um patricia Patricia? Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, hey, everybody. I just, my name is Patricia Barraza. I am a Beacon director as well as a student, former student of SFUSD. Um, I went through peer resources programs all through middle and high school and also as an intern, which definitely affected the choice that I made as a career moving forward. So I would just love to put it in your ear again that although I'm sure you hear back and forth many programs that are advocating for themselves to stay in the budget. Um, peer resource is one that I definitely want to keep considering and keep talking about. I have not heard whether we are still in the budget or not in the budget, but I do want to make sure that um, I do highlight the fact that it is a needed program and that uh, we are here to talk and we are here to figure it out and our students are benefiting greatly from leadership programs in our district on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Leslie? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Leslie Hu. I'm the secretary of UESF. Um, I wanted to speak on um, and remind us all the intention of what Prop G is, right? It's to recruit and retain educators by inching, I say the word inching, towards a living wage. It's called the Living Wage for Educators Act. And using Prop G in this way is not what the voters of San Francisco intended. It doesn't address the other real problem in addition to the deficit. The deficit, we all know it's a really big issue. We have to be focused on that. But the other problem is that we have an increase 
of over 620% of educator resignations this year. It's only December 1st, 620. That's the percentage increase over previous years. And so using Prop G money in this way to address a structural deficit requires structural solutions, as Ms. Wallace said. Um, and using these funds earmarked for something totally different is replicating the mistakes that have gotten us here to begin with and is fiscally irresponsible. Um, and I really want to kind of make sure that we have that intention in our minds as we're talking about these monies. Thank you. Jasmine. Hello, um, I am a senior at John O'Connell High School and I just kind of want to build on what Patricia said um, and kind of how essential that is. Um, considering I come from like an underfunded high school I do really think that we need to keep funding our programs, um, particularly in the DCT program, which is a construction trade. And it's really essential to our high school because we don't really have anything else to offer. And taking away those opportunities um, will, will really deteriorate um, on students' educations, considering that we don't have a variety of classes to offer. And I think it's essential to offer the proper nourishment and enrichment for students to have a really great education. Um, let's see, Zoe. Zoe. Um, okay, nobody's there. Um, Jerry. Hey, good evening. This is Jerry Almanza. I'm the UESF treasurer. Um, so, you know, I, 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 okay. So this one time money shouldn't be used to solve our systemic mismanagement problem. I feel really disappointed that our finance team is still continuing to try to solve a structural problem on the backs of our students and our educators. Those um, proposals that were shown you know, you're showing, you know, two, three people cut per site. That is not what our students and our families need right now. We are still struggling through COVID. Our families are still struggling. Our, our teachers are quitting on a daily basis. Dr. Matthews, you've been subbing, right? Like we don't have enough people. Like how does it make sense to not ensure that every classroom and every school site is fully funded and has the resources that they need. This money that we have needs to be used to support our students. We need to invest in our students. When we, it's been a continued disinvestment, our district has money. We're just not putting it in the right place. I still don't see any changes to the admin section. Like, I don't understand why it is that we're protecting top upper management but yet we are cutting the people that are working with our students directly on a daily basis. This one-time funding is not the solution to the structural deficit. We need to retain our educators. We need to support our students. Thank you. Julie. Hi, um, I appreciate the breakdown that shows the impact on school sites. That's really helpful as we, as our school site council starts trying to understand how this will impact us. Um, but what I see is really concerning. I have a hard time seeing the equity in this plan. We know the demographics of a small elementary school with 200 or fewer students. And we know the demographics of an elementary school that's larger with 530 students. So if my math is correct, we're saying that the small elementary school with 17 staff would lose five staff, which is about a third of the adults on their site. That's a dramatic impact on a school. On the other hand, if you look at the larger elementary school with about 27 staff losing um, about three, that's about a 10% impact. And even at those school sites, that's gonna hurt. Is that at either of these sites, is that the new um, dynamic teacher who's working to integrate ethnic studies into the school? 
Is that the new dynamic teacher who's supporting the ELAC? Because those are the set, those are that's what the new teachers are doing at, at our school site. On the flip side, I agree that Prop G is a unique opportunity. It's dedicated sustainable funds, and Prop G does include a promise to student to black students for $2.7 million a year of community school dollars. Doing the math on that, that's $8.1 million for schools serving black students and the equity that's built into that agreement prioritizes schools that serve blacks or have a majority of black students um, with about dedicating about 6 million to 10 schools or about 600,000 per school site. If you can imagine the impact that, that completing that promise would have for schools. For schools that um, are considered equity gap schools, that's still $2.1 million divided by 10 schools, that's $210,000 um, for each school site. Um, I would ask that you complete the promises of Prop G, um, come up with a more equitable solution for balancing the budget. Thank you. Zoe? Hi, are you able to hear me this time? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, not sure what happened the first time. Yeah, I am a TSA with the Career Technical Education Department, and I have a couple of students here who are hoping to speak about their experiences um, being in CTE pathways. So I'm going to give it to Horace to go ahead and share his experience. Hello, my name is Horace. I'm in 12th grade at Washington, and uh, I'm in the uh, automotive uh, engineering program. Uh, it's, it's a great experience and opportunity for you to get like hands-on learning with cars. And it's the only high school in the city that offers this. And it's like, a lot of us want to go into the automotive career when we leave high school. So it's a great opportunity to get exposed to stuff that not a lot of high schoolers can uh, experience. Um, good evening. My name is, uh, Abraham. I'm at 11th grader, uh, George Wash high school. Um, I like how this school has that program or um, auto shop. I, I got a letter from Lowell High School and I had to transfer to this school for this program, especially. And I think it's one of the reasons I go to school every day. Without it, I don't think like, it's not the same experience I would have every day. Like, even though like we go here with friends and it's like, without it, I will just like skip classes and just leave. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, Rennie? Hi, um, my name is Renee Ashba. I'm a counselor and AVID site coordinator at Hoover Middle School. And I just want to um, speak up about the AVID program. Um, you know, the numbers are on the website of how effective the program is at um, getting our students starting in middle school through high school and graduating and going to college. Um, the program like directly aligns with Vision 2025. And so I'd love for you to reconsider totally cutting it out of the budget. Thank you. Ingrid. Hello, my name is Ingrid Reyes. I'm a SFUSD alum. I graduated in 2019. And I just wanted to touch on the AVID program as well. I currently also as a college ambassador at SFUSD, and I just wanted to add that I know that one of the programs that might be cut in funding and might be eradicated, um, and I wanted to add the importance that it is for students. I personally saw it as an avid student help me um, have an upper leg when I was applying to colleges, specifically senior and senior year, and also working with the seniors this last year, it showed the difference on how um, seniors in the AVID program did have an upper leg able to apply to colleges, have early access to those materials, while others struggling to gain that because they weren't in the program. So I just wanted to emphasize the important program and how it does help um, minority groups and overall just expose them to the chances of going to college and help them get a better future for themselves. Thank you. Try Alan Lee one more time. Alan? Oh, okay, we have another one. So Kevin? 
Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening, um, board members. My name is Kevin. I'm a San Francisco State um, student and a former ELD student at Lincoln. And recently I've had the opportunity to work as a college ambassador at Lincoln as well. Um, and I would like to share a, my experience working in, in the AVID environment and working closely with one of um, one of my students was um, a first generation someone student and who I saw who in the first meeting I saw she had like a, a lot of motivation to go to college but a lot of questions and doubts regarding what will happen after high school. Fortunately as the first few weeks passed um, um, I was able to work closely with her and the avid teacher as well and she understood the steps she needed to take to have a safe future. But most importantly, she understood why she needed to take the, why she wanted to take those steps, and just um, the week after the college application opened, she already had done all, all of her applications, and she was not only leading herself to a brighter future, but also inviting her peers to follow the same path as she would invite them to come um, inside the avid class, and. Honestly, this wouldn't be possible without the right teacher and the right space and the right um, support. And um, overall, this wouldn't be possible without AVID. So I just wanted to highlight the importance that AVID has in my community at Lincoln and other communities as well. That's all there is, Commissioner. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the public for your comments and just want to acknowledge how important it is to have the engagement of our community uh, as we go through this um, budgeting and, and stabilization plan and although uh, a very difficult one, um, but very necessary. And I just want to also extend my appreciation again for last night's um, community partners in um, part putting together and uh, engaging in the community town hall. We had strong participation as well as the release of a survey that is gone out to families um, for their engagement to our stakeholders as well more broadly. So uh, with that, I would like to open it up to my colleagues for discussion. I do wanna recognize time. The last two meetings, I think I have kept you all over. Uh, we will also be discussing um, the budget um, this upcoming Tuesday's uh, meeting on December 7th. So just wanted to uh, have this discussion, open the, the space up for the next 45 minutes or so. And so that I can wrap up our, um, our committee um, right on time. And with that, I also want to reference back to slide 20 of the presentation to help us guide. I certainly appreciate uh, if my colleagues would, um, you know, have your questions that are uh, related to uh, some of the, the guiding um, questions around, you know, what, what staff has proposed tonight around the Prop G. Does that strike that right balance of stabilization with staffing? Um, thoughts around um, you know, the res restor uh, restoring $10 million to weighted student formula. Um, is that the, um, you know, right direction? And are there specific areas of the plan that requires that we would like to have closer uh, review, discussion, and details? Um, and then we'll also um, like to have the discussion around the OPEB and that uh, Commissioner Alexander raised earlier. So with that, um, Commissioner Bogus, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I, I guess for me, I, I would just say, I think the option that I am like naturally more inclined to is like option D and putting the most money towards um, kind of paying down the amount that's owed. Um, and I think I'm really interested in the flexibility that we gain as a district from option B or option C. And, and I guess I, at this point, I, I guess like how much clarity would we kind of have on what it looks like to actually do that? Or is it more like this is all the clarity we kind of can have right now and we kind of have to figure out and hope for like best intentions um, out of it versus worst case scenario for kind of the impact of it. I, I guess I'm trying to understand how much clarity I can have to expect about the impact of those dollars being diverted versus the impact of them kind of being paid to, to, to pay that down. I don't know if there's any clarity that can be provided 
around that. I'm just I'm just curious. Um, just just how much more like information we can have, or if it is just making a decision based off um, the information we kind of currently have in front of us. Um, Commissioner, just to clarify, um, are you wondering about um, the impacts of the funds to like, like how about the details of the OPEB investment or how those funds would be used and, and the benefit um, for budget or staffing stabilization? Yeah, the benefits of staffing and budget stabilization. Hey, versus hey. Girl, were you there at that meeting just now with UBC? Versus the OPEB um, pre-funding um, and just kind of like, just kind of, yeah, I guess just a little bit more about the thoughts and the rationale and kind of the overall benefit that you know families um, and sites would expect to kind of see from from that decision versus like option B. Does that make sense? Comparing option B to D and the impact, um, both kind of in the next few years and kind of long term. I think um, the rationale for option B um, that I tend to lean on is we are seeing vacancies uh, in positions. We're having a hard time recruiting employees into our districts and um it's sort of the it's the hidden impact of um yeah, that that we've discussed a bit but it's it, it's hitting us differently than talking about budget cuts like budget cuts we're making decisions around how to stabilize and balance our budget um we're sort of making those hard choices through that through those discussions but the vacancies are currently happening and i think have a true impact at our school sites um you know we think about the drain on you know just even starting with the the staff who are trying to support our students and like you know starting with our students and are they being supported if there are vacancies where staff is having to be juggled around we can't bring in substitutes you've got to move one student you know students between classes to try to make sure um, that they have a teacher because we couldn't get a substitute on time um, just the the drain on um, our administrators because um, we aren't adequately staffing our sites and then taking that also to the central allocations where we're not able to hire paraeducators to provide the supports that our students need I would add that this it's in a typical year, we probably wouldn't this, especially at a time when we know we are trying to um, develop a plan to um, stabilize our budget, we might not uh, be making or have this in a stabilization plan. But this year is like no other year. Um, I think you probably have heard this from um, either teachers or paraprofessionals or uh, custodians or principals. Um, the as um, uh, Chief Wallace was just saying, a big part of the issue is that as people continue to typically, if people left during the year, we would you know be able to hire within a few days, if not a week at the longest. Um, that's just not the case. Uh, we still have people uh, during you know a, a week, um, seven, three, five, seven people will will resign. Uh, we're not able to fill those holes. And the other impact that it's having is that um, as we have these vacancies, um, staff members are having to cover those vacancies. So usually they may have a prep. They don't have that prep. And this just it's causing uh, wear and tear on staff and, um, to be honest with you, taking morale down. So we're just trying to look at some of the ways that we could possibly um, uh, both do everything we can to keep people from leaving as well as try to boost morale. And as said earlier, we'll have more conversations about this uh, with you in closed and of course with our labor partners. No, I appreciate that clarity. Um, and for that additional information, I feel like that was that was very helpful for me. I, I guess my last question on this subject, then maybe I will let uh, other commissioners ask questions, and maybe have opportunity to go again later if possible is, um, could we kind of talk about the the ways that these funds will be used and kind of the long term impact? Because I guess what I'm worried about is that if we put this money aside now, does that mean that we are essentially kicking the can down the road in some way, shape, or form, and it would have 
a greater negative impact kind of in the future on our ability to kind of staff or research resource different programs and things of that nature, um, if that makes sense. If we go ahead and invest the funds in OPEB, will it create other challenges? No, if we spend the funds on support for staffing and budget stabilization now versus OPEB, I, I think I'm just kind of wondering, like, are there is there anything that that money is going to that will eventually have to be reduced or cut out kind of based on our current budget projections? Or is that things that are kind of outside of that process, if that makes sense? Um, well, I would say that for the staffing stabilization, it will be critical that those are one time investments because this is a one time source. So if down the road, new funds come in and there's a choice on the part of the district to prioritize use of those funds in the staffing stabilization. That's a choice that could be made later, but just want to be clear that this is a, a one-time source for a one-time use is how we would need to negotiate it to make sure that we're not creating def a larger deficit for ourselves down the road. Um, and so I think um, on the staffing side in that way, we're not kicking the can and creating a deficit, a deeper deficit, but on the restoration of funds on the operating, on the budget for budget stabilization, um, because it is a one-time source in that way, we are kicking the can on, um, on that component um, of our budget balancing. And so it, if we were to see additional state funds come in um, that are ongoing and can support those operations, um, uh, you know, I, I would recommend that either we, um, I guess there are two parts. One, either we move those one-time Prop G sources out of that restoration and only rely on the ongoing source to cover that cost, um, uh, or we simply build in to our projections that um, in the third year, um, in fiscal year 24, 25, that um we would see a decline in that funding source and, and that would have to be then part of our budget balancing strategy for that fiscal year so there's a little bit of both i guess to answer your question there's some that if we make it one time it's not a problem uh, but part of it is ongoing and therefore we are uh, continuing to maintain uh, some of that um, uh, structural uh, uh, destabilization for ourselves. Megan, as a follow up to that, um, I'm sorry, we didn't have the slides of the of the third year. And I know that, uh, you know, the third the third year through three through five it, um, are pretty quote squishier. Um, but maybe could you speak to that um, of that, that deficit in that third year? D does it continue? It does continue to deepen? Absolutely. It. Yeah, I, th I think until we see um, some real shifts in our state funding, um, particularly, you know, with our trajectory on enrollment, which is currently aiming downward, um, we are looking at uh, ongoing deficits, even with these budget control measures um, in those following fiscal years, um, there are deficits in our outlook. Um, so all the more reason why I'll keep saying we're building the muscles, we're having, learning how to have these conversations around prioritization, um, uh, because really the conversation's not going to stop after this year. Um, um, that being said, that um, I know we're all eager to see how the state manages um, the statewide decline in enrollment, um, and if we do see uh, potentially increases in uh, per ADA funding. Um, that that could help our outlook. Um, but I think the reality is that um, particularly with things like uh, healthcare, um, pension, uh, retiree benefits, these things just keep growing at, at paces that are generally uh, faster uh, than our revenue growth. Thank you. Commissioner Alexander? Thanks, yeah. Just to pick up on the, this thread of conversation and the kicking the can, down the road uh, metaphor. Um, I guess that concerns me also. Um, you know, when I first heard about the Prop G um, uh, decision, I was really excited. I was like, oh, that's great. We, we can um, cut less, right? But over the past couple of days, as I've been reflecting on it, um, and even just listening to you talk right now, Chief Wallace, I think I just have real concerns about that because I feel like we're putting off effectively where when we, if we use some of the property funds to spend um, 
to, to, to cover the deficit in the next two years, it's just creating this cliff again in the third year. Um, and that just feels like putting off a hard decision. Um, and so that concerns me. And I, I mean, that's why I guess, that's why I was sort of asking about, could we put more in the rainy day reserve? I'd almost rather invest more of that money in the rainy day reserve so we have it. So if things get bad, we can use it, but still kind of force ourselves to make the hard decisions that we need to make to be fiscally responsible right now. That's kind of what I'm thinking right now. I guess a related question to that would be, what's, when do we really have to decide? Because my other question would be, could we wait see the, the, the state outlook in January. I'm, I'm concerned if we say, oh, we're gonna add 10 million or 20 million back to, to the budget balancing plan now, it kind of, again, lets us off the hook. But if we, by December 14th, have to pass a worst case scenario plan, we assume we use none of the Prop G money for that. Then we see where the state is in January. We kind of go through the process. And if we wanna then, then restore a little bit of it using Prop G, we could. That also just feels, feels better um, to me in some ways. So I'm just curious about the timeline also for, for that. Yeah, I would agree with your summary that we, you know, we can very well move forward a worst case scenario balancing plan. Um, and that um, the decision around Prop G, I would say that there's not real urgency uh, to it, I think the main um, strings that are attached to it is that we are, you know, if we want to assume the full 150 million that the city will forgive our, you know, 26.6 million dollar loan, that we're demonstrating a real effort um, to stabilize our budget um, and our fiscal outlook. Um, so I think um, maybe the one thing that gives me pause is, you know, if if there is a commitment on the part of the board to show that we are intending to use those one-time funds um, to help restore our rainy day reserves and pre-fund OPEB, that those, those are two important stabilizers that we wouldn't change course and suddenly say, no, let's go ahead and use it all to balance our budget. Like that would be a complete uh, redirection that I think would be um, in opposition to uh, the recommendations of our what the city and what CDE yeah. are frankly looking for. Yeah, and I definitely wouldn't support that. So, yeah. or or maybe I just, I guess I would wonder as a wonder, could we as a board say in December that we're gonna commit um, commit the, the majority of it to rainy day and OPEB and, and perhaps the staffing, if the 25 million in staffing makes sense, or, but, but not use it for the other uses. And, but to say, look, if we wanna come back to this, we can. I mean, if it's in the rainy day reserve, I guess would be the more appropriate thing. Couldn't we then take it back out of the reserve if we wanted to? Um, do you see what I'm saying? Like if we put it in the rainy yes. day reserve, we could then take it back out if we felt it was necessary in the spring even, right? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um... This is where kind of the terminology of rainy day reserve versus our budget stabilization reserve. Like, um, uh, I think maybe uh, we'll we'll need to talk to the controller's office also just about the mechanics of moving funds back and forth. Once it's in the rainy day reserve, we're definitely locking it away in the city's treasury uh, more firmly. That the board needs to demonstrate that you need those funds in order to balance our budget. Um, so in that way, I would uh, encourage um, any component that's really intended to be flexible um, within uh, the board's reserve. Um, we've been calling it a budget stabilization reserve, but even that we can um, we could put forward a resolution that allows um, the board to you know be more directive of um, of when those funds can be unlocked. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I guess so. For me, as one board member, I would my it, leaning right now would be to not use the funds for the budget balancing, but rather to use them for the rainy day reserve and OPEB and perhaps the staffing if that um, is negotiated and feels right. Because I think it just concerns me to, to, um, to sort of set our, to use these one-time funds to, to deal with a structural deficit, because we're already doing that right with part of the 35 million Right, and in, 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 that's also built in there. Isn't some of that one-time funding that we've built up over the past couple of years? So it just, it just concerns me to use a lot of one-time funding to close our deficit for this coming year, I guess, is my position on that. 
Yes, that's correct. There are already um, one-time funds assumed within the balancing plan, so this would definitely um, increase that amount. Thank you so much for your work on this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Maybe I'll chime in, uh, Commissioner Bogus. Um, so just wanted to for, go back. <laughs> um, Megan, you asked a while ago about um, you know thoughts around the rainy day and bringing it to SFUSD. I'm a, I am a big proponent of that. I think um, making sure that we have access um, you know, to those funds in case, like you said, we have a big dip and we need that access. Um, and also, I also wanna make sure that that's clear to the California Department of Education that those dollars set aside um, traditionally at the city is um, specifically for the district. So um, I would be a proponent of that and continuing those conversations with the controller's office and what that process looks like. Um, going back to the budget stabilization, I appreciate Commissioner Alexander and Bogus's comments around, you know, does um, this, you know, uh, allocating the 25 million options be, um, mean that we're still gonna be absorbing those costs um, in year three. I, I think one thing that I would, and, and I appreciate that fiscal um, tenure of um, the approach, one thing that I, I think I would want some more details around is then, you know, how would that impact students and their, um, you know, educational experience in the classroom specifically, um, because, um, that's one thing about year three, um, certainly the multi-year projections is still really key that we would, in, you know, there be still a, a bit of a cliff, then I would want it to be clear for what that would mean potentially staffing wise, um, you know, personnel wise as well. So that, again, to, for that transparency that we've been hearing from our community, you know, how's this gonna impact my, my child's school? Or how's it gonna impact the programs that my students, and we heard from some students just tonight, right, about what that would mean. So I just think I, I would want to be very clear about that as well, both to both for board members such as myself, but also um, for the public as we sprint um, to the final December 14th. And certainly I, I hear that, you know, that doesn't behoove us from, um, you know, bringing that back um, after January and hearing what our, um, you know, what the state's plans are. So with that, I would also coupled with that would be supportive of then a separate budget stabilization reserve as Megan, you have put forward and then also just be very clear um, through um, a staff, you know, a recommended resolution to staff around those clear criteria because I just wouldn't want it to be, you know, uh, we just have to fill some financial gap because we had to, I think we have to be really clear that this has to have student impact and educational outcomes because that's one thing right now that, um, you know, as we come, um, as we're steering through the pandemic, we're steering through um, really staffing challenges and overall workforce, um, you know, crisis, frankly, like how is it that we're gonna, um, you know, continue to um, make that progress and support for our, our students and their, and their educational outcomes. So I hope that it gives you a sense of kind of where I'm at. And again, if you need clarity, I, I can be more. Yeah, I mean, correct. maybe just to restate a little bit what I've heard is, I think we're looking at actually three reserves that we have our 2% required economic reserve as you know, it's required by the state. On top of that, we're socking away $40 million in a rainy day reserve that would, those, those funds would be more firmly locked um, that the board would act in the event of an actual rainy day, much like um, the board would act uh, to re uh, release the funds from the city's um, accounts. Um, and then the final reserve is the budget stabilization where we could dip into it um, in order to make sure that we're able to support th those programs um, and supports that, um, that are necessary to achieve the desired outcomes for our students. That's, that's what I'm hearing and maybe also pulling together a little bit. Just to, is, that, is that consistent with your thinking, Commissioner Lamb? Yes, and I would actually name, thank you for reminding me, um, because between the rainy day reserve, um, set the set aside of the minimum um, for um, our um, 
reserves, you know, doesn't quite get us, it does not get, it's at 6%, I believe you said, I would want to increase that even closer to the 10%. So maybe we'll take in the middle. How can yeah. we increase it to 8%? Commissioner Lamb, I want to correct the record. Um, my calculation, this, this is actually good news, but I apologize for misstating earlier. The six, um, the 6% was tied to the 40 million. Um, but if we're reducing our expenses and increasing our reserves, the combination of our existing economic uncertainty reserve and this 40 million um, is just over 9%. Uh, so we're actually quite close. Um, so I apologize for misstating that earlier. Definitely want to correct the record um, that I would tie those to being closer to 9%. Great. That's super helpful. So then we could even get to the 10% then <laughs> um, with that third of the budget stabilization to get us to that 10%. So that's a, a, um, a preference that I have. I also just want to name the how important that um, OPEB pre-funding is. Um, and I, I would like to give that opportunity to um, you know, either you, Megan, or even to um, our, let's see, Ms. 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 sorry. Did we lose? Commissioner, we appear to have lost our quorum, so we will need to wait and hope that Commissioner Lamb can reconnect. That's a good point. That's a good point. So, I mean, it, it makes it simpler if it's just you, Commissioner, but. <laughs> That's right. I vote for everything. <laughs> um, I'm glad that someone's paying attention to the fact that I would not have caught him because Commissioner Bogus is here, but he's not technically a committee member. So. I'm texting her right now. And we're back. Sorry, my, my Wi-Fi tapped out. Um, so if we could also have Mr. Dushan um, explain a bit about the OPEB, the value, you know, the importance and what he sees across the state as well. And uh, really, you know, as we embark on this um, to address our long-term liabilities, we'd like to get Elliot's perspective. Thank you, Commissioner. A um, couple of comments and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I just realized that the light in this room is kind of odd. So I'm sorry for the glare. Um, the OPEB is a critical issue because that's an ongoing growing issue that kind of like the reverse of a good stock. Um, it's going to gain money, but that money is money you have to pay in future years. And with a growing population, I mean, growing increase in age, and I know you have actuarials in the district, that is not going to get better. And that's that's one of, I, I'm putting together recommendations for next week. And I think that's a critical issue to get a handle on that. And I, I just might say that even beyond the next three years, which is what the state is looking at, you don't want to be in a position at year four to say we have to get a loan. The, the other comment I want to make is that the biggest driver of your structural deficit is maintaining existing staff levels with, with declining enrollment. So where you need to make cuts in the budget are where your enrollment is declining. And you know that doesn't necessarily mean there's less service at a school site. I mean, if you have 400 students instead of 600 students, they really don't need the staff you had at 600 students. So I, I want to really clarify that when you're dealing, because I dealt with declining enrollment for 17 years, and it, it isn't fun, but you can project your staffing needs and oftentimes deal with it with things like attrition and, and other things. But that's the main thing. If I were sitting as a commissioner, I would be looking beyond the three years even in terms of where that enrollment's going, because that's a trend that's probably not going to reverse, so that you have a practice in place to deal with that enrollment decline and still provide the needed supports to schools. I don't know if that makes sense, but 
that's your driver. And the thing is, in some respects, if you have to reduce staff, even by attrition, which where, you know, no harm, no foul to the people who would be leaving, that's probably going to increase your OPEB obligation because you have more staff that are not working than are working. That proportion increases. So back to the initial question, OPEB is, is absolutely critical. And secondly, the main driver, if we were going to root causes, oh, is going to be declining enrollment. Thank you so much. Um, so again, thank you. Um, and panelists, please mute if you're not speaking, please. Thank you. Um, and so with that, um, affirming how important it is from my perspective of the pre-funding of OPEB, um, both in options um, B um, and C. So I think um, that that's my current round of comments and questions, but I certainly welcome um, Commissioner Bogus. Commissioner Alexander, did you have something first? I saw you, you go ahead, you go first. That's good. Yeah. Michelle, thank you. Um, I think, I guess my concern is that we aren't dealing with the structure of our school district enough within this balancing plan. Um, it seems to get us to a safe place, but doesn't kind of change the dynamics of how we operate as a district. And I think the concern for me projecting forward to the budget is that we will be presenting that we have kind of a similar capacity than we kind of previously had when there actually will be kind of a larger feel in the reduction of services because of kind of the cuts that are expected. Um, and I guess I guess, how do we how do we balance that? How do we kind of have convers, how are we having conversations with folks about that? Because I feel like it has been expressed to me on the board as far as like how critical our budget situation is and how we have to shrink the size of our district and reduce staffing and increase class sizes. And I don't feel like maybe that we're saying that enough. And I guess just to, to say like, do we feel like this plan essentially shores us up in the long term for where we need to be? Or is this essentially kind of our first step of kind of getting aligned and that in the next two or three years, we're going to actually have to come back and look at doing some major restructuring or reorganizing um, of our institution? Thank you, Commissioner. I think um, I'm going to pick a hybrid of the options that you just laid out that we're we're not by any means done. And we're also not gonna have the luxury of waiting a couple or, or a few years to come back. Um, I think that this does get us in a safe place for now. And really between now and budget development for fiscal year 23, 24, we're gonna need to continue the work. And I think part of what I hope I've brought to the table of trying to engage my colleagues and the board and the public around zero-based budgeting is not that we're doing a perfect round of zero-based budgeting, it's just getting our minds around what is core and essential to our districts and what are the things we do because of our priorities and what are enhancements. And I think, I think we've done a pretty good job given the conditions <laughs> that we've been in in, um, in the pandemic um, and just all of the different exercises that staff has had to go through um, you know to keep moving on and making sure that our students are being supported through all of this um, to come up with an initial balancing plan um, but i think we're also learning it's a it's a first attempt at really shoring things up but um, we also know that we have declining enrollment uh, i'm going to go ahead and touch on the third rail that nobody wants to talk about is that we also have a lot more school sites than many other districts and therefore the administrative burden of carrying those school sites is very high for our district um, i also think that we need to get a better handle on what are our functions as a district versus a county office um, and these are all things that are ongoing bodies of work. Um, and I wouldn't dare say that we can solve all of them in one year. I know um, between Anne-Marie Myung and I, we're certainly trying, <laughs> uh, but um, this is about as far as we're going to get at this point in time. Um, so I would say um, 
we've done a real, just to recap, we've done a really good job, but I think that there are bodies of work that need to continue um, to help write us along so that when we get into budget development next year and we continue to see that def deficit on the horizon, by then we'll have done more work to evaluate how to address these structural issues, uh, particularly around enrollment and how uh, we want to provide services to our students. No, I appreciate that clarity. And I think the, the one more thing I think for me just to bring up and then I'll let Commissioner um, Alexander continue is um, I think I worry about our ability to perform like the, the the required tasks with the projected cuts that we currently have in the budget. I mean, and just to lift it up, I, I think like hearing people's concern around the central office spending um, and kind of like the desire to reduce funding from there it makes me wonder how we'll operate as a district with reduced staffing there because we're so dependent on them to support school sites. And so I, for me, I feel like the part of the conversation about what does it look like for us to adapt and to be responsive after these cuts still needs to happen. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to kind of have a more full conversation in the spring about it. Because for me, it's like, we can, we can say that we'll make these cuts on paper, but for the people who have to actually do it, um, their workload isn't being reduced. And I think we need to figure out how we're addressing that um, so that we really can can see enrollment grow. I, I do actually feel like our enrollment is is going to, to increase um, and that we have kind of the power to, to pull people back into our district um, just because I feel like our, our city is also in a place where it wants to grow too. So I, I'll, I'll pause there and make way for others. Thank you. Commissioner Alexander. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I um, just had a bunch of thoughts. I think one, I think I respectfully disagree with um, Commissioner Bogus about enrollment. I don't know. Maybe it'll grow. I, I think. Well, I'm just gonna say. I think that's a. I hope that's true. But um, my concern is that it seems like it's a statewide and even a national trend. And so I don't know if we can buck that trend. I mean, we are bucking it a little bit. Our enrollment has actually declined less than the statewide average, um, which is which is good. But it's not. I don't know that we're going to see increases, and I think Mr. Duchamp's point that our that our um, that really the root cause of the deficit is that we have uh, enrollment that doesn't sustain our staff. So we have the enrollment has fallen slightly, and revenue hasn't increased, and so now we have too many staff. And it's very clear that we're going to have to make staff reductions. Like that's, and they're going to be significant staff reductions. Um, and so I think th there's a piece that's a little bit missing from some of this conversation, which is where we make those staff reductions. And I think, um, you know, uh, I think folks may know that Commissioner Sanchez and I are working on an alternative proposal that, um, you know, because we've done a, a lot of analysis. The two of us actually uh, have been in this district for, you know, 25 plus years as teachers and then principals. And we've actually seen uh, how our budget has shifted over the years. We were talking uh, today about how back in the 90s, a principal reported to an assistant superintendent who reported directly to the superintendent. So there was, there was two layers above a principal. Now we have principal, director, assistant superintendent, deputy superintendent, superintendent. And I think that just sort of illustrates what's happened over the past 20 years, not through any bad intentions, but um, you know, I think bureaucracies have a, a habit of growing. Um, you know, we, we looked at some data from 2009-10. Back in 2009-10, we had two deputy superintendents, we had three chiefs, and we had 24 executive directors and directors. So that was 10 years ago. Now we have three deputy superintendents, 12 chiefs, and 76 executive directors and directors. So the, and these are all folks that are making between $130,000 and $250,000 a year in salary alone, not to mention benefits. Um, when we compare to comparable districts, um, we had some conversation about Long Beach, but actually when you look at any um, large district in California, we have a, we spend a lot more on administration, we spend more on indirect services, and we spend less on um, direct classroom instruction and other school-based services like social workers and folks that are actually at the school serving kids. And so I think um, we're going to have to make these cuts. They're going to be hard cuts. There's going to be reductions in service. Um, but I think the question that faces the board is what's the fiscally responsible way to make those cuts? 
So, um, so commissioners Andrews and I are going to propose are going to say more about that next at next week's committee of the whole and formally kind of introduce that proposal. But, um, but I, so, but I'm a big proponent to that all that being said, I'm a big proponent of making the cuts. Like, I really think we need to do it. And not that I'm excited about it, but I, but that's what I was saying earlier is I just don't think we can kid ourselves into thinking we can't have this conversation. I think that's going to be a hard conversation and we can have a really good debate over where do we make those cuts, right? But I think we have to we have to make them because we just don't have the enrollment to sustain the staffing that we have um, as a district. And so um, that I just wanted to say that kind of given this the previous line of conversation. But the um, the question I had really was around OPEB, and, and again, um, you know, Chief Wells, if this is not the right forum, or if we want to do this as a follow up, I just would love to get more detail on that, especially with our declining staff and um, you, you know some of the questions I had asked earlier just around how do we calculate the demand I'm a bit I really think we should make that investment and I would argue if we don't put it in OPEB like if the OPEB investment is smaller then we should increase the rainy day investment right so I want to be clear on that but 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 I would just love to get some documentation on that of like how do we calculate that that 60 million number based on the need um, so we could share that with with the public at some point. Sure. Um, just for a little bit of context about how I got the numbers, um, I did work with our actuary who uh, prepares a report that's required um, by CDE. Um, and, you know, um, the actuarial report that we use um, maps out some of the details around the number of currently retired employees and certificated classified and other uh, types of positions. Um, and and looks at the you know current number of, of those retirees and then extrapolates out on the current uh, um, uh, number of employees at our district and looking into the future anticipating how many retirees will have over time um, and so it's a working with our actuary um, I was able to create a model um, to that then allows me to uh, develop different scenarios um, to estimate what our liability will be based upon different levels of investment. Um, and what we found was that 50 million is the sweet spot, 50 million plus $10 million committed to pre-funding on an ongoing basis. And so 60 million is really 50 million in the first year and 10 million in the second, uh, so as not to mess up our deficit outlook in that second year. Um, and so it really was, it was working with our actuary um, having him review the model um, and validate it so that we would have a tool to help us have a working way of testing out the value of our different levels of investment. Um, and I will say it's very complicated. I learned a lot working with our actuary. Um, um, so I'd be happy to, um, you know, find a forum to present that information, maybe even bring our actuary in um, because I'm my understanding of it is still fairly rudimentary compared to him to his understanding so um but at least now you have a, a foundation that it, it was the number was not given to me uh, i do have a very uh good understanding of the calculations um and it and these numbers were reviewed and validated by our actuary yeah yeah no i assumed that and it makes perfect sense and i guess i would just yeah i think that like a forum like that would be great just because i've been getting questions about it which i I'm far, much farther away from you at being able to answer. So I guess I wanted to be able to sort of just make that data available. Like what we're, you know, how do we come to that number? So, so yeah, if we could figure that out, either either in a written document or in a forum, I think would be fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up our discussion for tonight. I hope staff feels that this has been um, productive, useful as far as guiding us to um, getting us to the balancing plan of December 14th. And we have a, um, our big December 7th. Um, and I look forward to learning in detail about Commissioner Alexander and Sanchez's proposal. Um, I've been asked about it. I, said, I, I don't have all the details to it because then it'd be violating Brown Act. So um, and staying true to that. Um, one thing I did want to ask a, a request for Mr. Dushan, I know that you had mentioned that you're going to have some recommendations for next Tuesday and talking about the overall, um, you know, as you and your team have now dove in and for a 
probably what six weeks now, maybe at most. Um, but would really like to um, hear from you on Tuesday around, you know, what has been um, the impact or effect of, you know, um, like you said, the declining of enrollment and then the staffing ratios and, and what you see is uh, really before us um, as a district to not only the decisions, but really that longer term beyond beyond that three to five year because I uh, Commissioner Bogus as much as I want to be optimistic you know I, I would think that I would like to plan for that the enrollment will continue to what we've seen and it's not just COVID it was actually declining now right we're in our fifth year of decline um, and certainly we'll we shall put together some plans around you know how do we think about um, increasing that enrollment, what does our zero through five, or especially our um, children of ages three to five and with transitional kindergarten look like. But to me, that's a longer term planning. Um, so Mr. Dushan, if I could request that um, next week, if that is going to be part of your presentation or recommendation around um, declining enrollment, the size of our district um, and you know, in operations, frankly, overall. Yeah, and I'll give you a, a little movie trailer here that I, I think a lot of it is going to have to do with the couple of things you just said, Commissioner Lamb, and that's that irrespective of whether enrollment grows or declines, what the district needs is processes in place to be facile about that and to adapt to it um, a little bit more readily than at least what I've observed. So that's going to be part of it to put in place operations that you know, work and can allow you to adapt to coming years. And I've heard a lot of that conversation and I think that's really good. I think also to look at, and I, and I applaud that there's gonna be other options put on the table. I don't think anybody's going to know till you get till January and you have your enrollment, early enrollment projections and your allocation projections for schools how to deal with both the district office support and the school site support. And I think the process, I, I know there's a lot of angst and a lot of pain, um, but we don't know yet till we get those numbers what it's really gonna look like. And you do have a significant amount of attrition as does every single district in the state um, with employees. So um, it may be more a matter of not filling positions. And I don't wanna make any promises. Some people may be rift, so. Okay, that's the but that's the trailer, the good and the bad. Thank you, Commissioner Bogus. Maybe I'll after your comment or question, we'll wrap up for this evening. Thank you. Yeah, just one last question. Um, in regard to the um, the sample kind of proposed school site budgets, I'm curious as to what kind of advisement and kind of support sites would have in making difficult budget decisions. So like looking at the site that had to get rid of the literacy coach, like would we be advising a site not to do that if they are having issues around literacy with, you know, focal populations like black students or other students, or would it be solely kind of left to the discretion of, of the site and the school site council process? Or, and just kind of, I guess, how do we handle those types of things? So I'm really, I'm really not, <laughs> not meaning for this to be a debate um, with with uh, Commissioner Alexander, but they would they would actually be those are the kinds of discussions that they would have with their directors and their assistant soups, and that's where that support would come from. I mean, we give some guidance, but the real heart of those conversations around what the school looks like they you know they talk to their staff they talk to their team but then the support really comes from the uh, directors insistent suits okay and so that's this kind of the decision making process internally and then ultimately you would present kind of a, a budget for the school sites to us kind of based on all that information that's kind of reflective of that but ultimately the decision is at the site through multiple layers of like chain of command and communication. Exactly. Okay, that, that's my last question. Thank you so much for that clarity. So at this time, I, I know that, um, you know, out of this tonight's meeting, we wanted to uh, give the budget team some clear direction from this committee 
to scaffold and uh, as we get ready for Tuesday nights, um, community as a whole, um, as far as specifically to the Prop G scenarios of funds, because that will play into an important part of um, the balancing plan, the overall uh, balancing plan. From our discussions tonight, I heard that there was um, between Commissioner Bogus and Alexander option D or, you know, really doing the um, supporting the pre-funding of OPEB, um, the rainy day fund, as well as a potential of that third, uh, um, ensuring that third uh, reserve, the budget stabilization reserve. Um, I express my support for option B, um, as well, I would certainly be supportive of D, but I think B also gives us a bit of an on-ramp um, for us to understand what, um, you know, how those reductions at school sites will look like, what will that mean um, for student learning experiences. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate some summary that I heard. Um, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Alexander. So I just to clarify that. So I was actually not supporting any of the options. I was almost kind of almost suggesting an option E, which would be well, close to option D, but but spending less on, um, I would say if, if the staffing piece, the 25 million for staffing, it makes sense with labor partners, then perhaps that, but then adding to the rainy day reserve. So putting 60 million in OPEB and more in the rainy day reserve, which would be, which was something that wasn't really on there. So I wonder if that might be able to be added, something along those lines. Megan, does that give you some direction there, or did you were you hoping for a, cons a consensus uh, recommendation from this committee? I don't know if we'll get there tonight, but um, and if it, I mean, it's really helpful just to hear these ideas. Um, and I guess my general sense is we're headed in the right direction of having rainy day and reserve and OPEB, um, and so then it's a matter of I think how how that final piece of funds, the 35 million is distributed either as a stable budget or staffing stabilization or redistributed to those other areas. Um, so maybe what I, with, with that input, I, I guess what I would recommend is um, that's helpful to hear tonight and we'll um, come back with some additional thinking um, next week on Tuesday and We'll also be trying to uh, walk the halls a bit more <laughs> with commissioners, and um, we do want to put forward, you know, the balancing plan that's, you know, closest to, you know, being ready for consensus on the 14th. So it's really that final piece that is the part that's up in the air. Any element of that that's identified for a stabil stabilization um, component, that's the risk. If we put forward a plan on the 14th that includes 25 million, I, I think then we would need to be clear if the board had different direction um, that, that, that it's clear how those funds would be used. So anyway, we just got to think about how we can be flexible and adapt in these final steps uh, for approval. Um, but I think this is a really helpful start. Commissioner Alexander, if you'd be willing to um, take a, a friendly, non -am friendly amendment and not official amendment, but um, you had mentioned rainy day. I think for me, it's really to make sure that rainy day is still classified as rainy day, which has, I think, a separate sorry. type of classification, yeah, 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 yeah. let's say a reserve for- Yeah, yeah, sorry. I meant more along the line. Sorry, I okay, can't express great. myself. You're, you're, what you're saying is what I meant to say. Okay. I, think, I think Chief Wallace got it. Okay. <laughs> and again, I wasn't trying to make a specific proposal. I was just saying in general, that was where I was leaning. So, right. thank you. And I see a nod from Commissioner Bogus. So hopefully, Megan, this gives you and the team um, some clear direction as we head into um, for the um, sprint to next Tuesday. So yes, I just you. want to thank you all uh, so to the budget team again, the tremendous work um, that you all are putting in day in and day out. Um, and I just wanted to express my deep appreciation um, for the work. Also to Mr. Dushan, thank you so much to you and your team for really steering and guiding and being a true partner. Um, I, I can't just express um, just that expertise and how, how I can, you know, has really been shared with this board. Um, and I hope you, um, and you've said it before, but uh, really the, the seriousness that this board is really taking and, and ensuring that this, our district, our 
you know, beloved district with our students um, is, is going to be fiscally solvent and healthy. So um, thank you all so, so much and, and have a great evening and um, see you next week. Thank you.